Hello everyone, welcome back to the RationalInvestor.com's uh, Weekend Frivolity. This is our broiler chicken show. Hello everyone, Here welcome comes back the to the soundbite. Actually, somebody even recorded this uh, recently, it was so cool. Let's see if I can do it today. Me, 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 me. Bark, 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 bark. No, started too high of a key. <laughs> I'll get it right one day. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I know I'm such a weirdo, eh, Andrew? Uh, hey, hey, the great part about this is it's a free video on YouTube. Have some fun. Um, tell some jokes. PMA for the win. All that kind of fun stuff. Um, still seeing some people piling in here, so that's good to see. Yeah, we've got a fairly uh, full room in the hangout here this morning. So, uh, of course, uh, hello, YouTubers. Uh, who's over there? Gog. Hello, Gog. That's an interesting name. Omar. Jack. Hello, Jack. Uh, happy Sunday, everyone. Indeed, Peter. Well, anyway, nice to uh, get this show off to a nice, uh, happy, uh, fluffy uh, start there. So, uh, feeling pretty good, PMA. Um, if anything, I don't know, do you all feel it would be interesting to uh, get sort of a barometer feeling of humanity? I get the feeling we're sort of going, uh, in fact, in the lounge last night, uh, Saturday nights, uh, what does Brian do? He sits and watches hours after hours after hours of uh, planetary alignments. And <laughs> this one video I watched last night on YouTube, this guy goes, uh, he does like 50 days of like intense lecturing and then... 50 days of fasting <laughs> and he's like i saw visions of the future and my future self and everything said watch out for 2021 oh boy um you know uh any way you slice it uh, i think <laughs> i think it, it'd be interesting to sort of take the sound bites of brian as we've been getting closer to 2020 then into 2020, I remember back in January, we were getting all excited about the, uh, Ju uh, what was it, the Saturn-Pluto cross. Then, uh, you know, all these uh, Jupiter-Saturn-Pluto-Earth conjuncts and um, walking us through the year. <laughs> Hopefully my message uh, through the whole thing was, oh boy, this is a mess -y. Um and it's probably going to remain that way for the rest of the year. So don't be shocked, people. Uh, if anything, I kind of like the idea that sort of the middle of the year is a bit of a pivot. Um, and then we're going to see, you know, it's funny, uh, you know, in the stock market, I've been playing the stock market. The first stock I bought was in 1988. Yeah, after the crash of 88. Uh, 87, excuse me. Um, and, uh, what's so funny is that nothing's really changed in the, um, in the investment industry since then. You think, you know, of course we've gotten more, uh, you know, technologically savvy, but really the, the process doesn't really change. Uh, you know, all you YouTubers, you want a nice free piece of information right up from the get go. And I used to know guys in the industry obviously taught me the expression, they would literally build their whole businesses off of it. It's really simple. Buy when it snows, sell when it goes. So uh, clearly the snow is in the going uh, sort of part of the cycle. Um, so on balance, I think it makes a lot of sense that people are paying themselves uh, for their hard effort that they put in back last uh, fall and winter and hell, uh, even through, you know, what's fascinating is, um, you know, you're also going to learn the significance of the Ides of March. Um, and historically, that's always been a very, very tough time uh, for us humans. And, you know, what's really interesting is you go back and you look at the price action and gee whiz. The whole damn market pivoted basically through the Ides of March there. Um, yeah, well, and so somebody here in the Hangout says, uh, so uh, can it be December now so I can actually go uh, buy some cheap alts? <laughs> As uh, all the people that bought the promotions into the spring and summer 
are, are discontented and disgruntled and sell the assets for their tax loss purposes. As I said, uh, this business is stunningly cliche. Um, and I might argue that uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, to a certain degree, especially those looking to make capital gains off of the cryptocurrency story, there's no difference in their behavior uh, between a typical stock promoter. Um, and, you know, the irony of it all is I think you can gauge uh, the quality of different cryptocurrency stories. Um, with a number of different fundamental matrix and just like the stock market you have relatively good stories and you have pieces of crap <laughs> and the worst part about it is right at the top of the market that's when of course the crap all starts to stick against the walls what we used to say um, so uh, you know in years gone by when it comes to things like crypto because a lot of fun to play in this space over the past few years um, you know, your summertime is usually your happy time. Uh, we often like to sort of use the trickle-down economics kind of analogy. Um, uh, you know, dad gets his tax refunds, and who knows in this crazy world right now, maybe it's, uh, um, maybe it's mom, maybe it's dad, maybe it's uh, the U.S. government handing out free money, whatever. Um, and it you know if people do have a couple bucks in their pockets it's sort of like a trickle down effect uh and the kids uh, start getting some money in their pockets and and you know uh in mom's basement we've all heard that expression before uh they're down there uh, trying to make a fortune buying the latest cryptocurrency uh and hey what the hell man i mean uh, look life is a gamble you know the irony of it all is that the chinese they they love gambling gambling is a part of their um psyche i mean there's a really funny story from the days of communism um they actually kept and we used to joke about this and i actually made a reference to an asset recently i go what is that like a chinese third market because it feels to me like, like literally, my broker is uh, here in Canada, and it wouldn't surprise me one bit. They're literally l running like a side market beside the actual real stock market. And I found out the other day, and I think they let it slip. I think the guy on the phone, uh, if, if the traders found out what he said, I think they wouldn't be very happy. Uh, but he said, uh, well, oh, your order wasn't even on that exchange. And I'm like, uh, well, this stock only is listed on the NASDAQ. So what the hell, where was my order listed? <laughs> Which is pretty shocking. But anyway, that's your another. Um, the, uh, during the days of communism, uh, especially just after Mao took over, he understood that there was a huge part of the population that still so supported the nationalists. And gambling is, is a part of sort of the Chinese culture and society. And so it, they, they actually created this, they used to call them uh, B shares. And they, they had literally a whole exchange of B shares that the gamblers just had to come and gamble and play and the stocks were worthless <laughs> it was, it's a crazy world we live in and of course you know like a country as big as china like billions of people i mean even one and this is what i this is what really scares me about the west is they the west has i think bitten off something that it doesn't really comprehend and that is, if we believe in this concept of globalization, if you think about it in real terms, what it literally means, if you are going to democratize the world's population, is that, I mean, you, you could have a room of, uh, say, 20 people. And let's say this is a conversation between, uh, in this funny little scenario, Canada and China. Well, tw technically, you could have a room of 20 people all democratically voting globalization, and the Canadians wouldn't even represent a fraction of one person in that room. Maybe you'd have a situation like, okay, well, this one 
who pretty much looks Chinese, happened to have a grandmother that happened to have a tie to some white person in the West. I mean, that's how diluted we will be in this globalization world. And I don't think the West really understands that. I know for certain in Canada we don't understand it. Another funny, and I don't know why I'm going off in this direction today, but what the hell, it's kind of fun. Uh, another used to, analogy I used to uh, give, and I try to explain this to Canadians, and they just don't get it, is if, you know, we all believe in the 1%. Well, if you have a population of 2 billion people, what is 1% of 2 billion? Well, that's a hell of a lot of people. Um, you know, I mean, just simple numbers, that's like, what, 20 million people. So that, considering the population of Canada is about somewhere around 30 million people, maybe 40 million people, what you're really saying is, is just the 1%, the elite, the billionaires, well, maybe not billionaires, but millionaires of the world of China literally is the entire population of Canada. <laughs> and what would happen if 1% of those 1% said, you know what, we're going to move to Canada and we're going to relocate. Well, that's like, what, 200,000 new millionaires. These are the 1%. Maybe they're even like multi-millionaires all flooding Canadian streets. So does it surprise us to see the massive price inflation going on around us? Not really. Um, they often say that uh, Larry Kudlow, who's uh, Trump's uh, chief economic advisor, uh, he's been around Wall Street forever, um, and back in the dot-com days, we used to always have this debate. And it's funny because Larry Kudlow put out a book in the dot-com days, Dow 30,000. And everybody was like, you're crazy. It'll never go there. How ironic, eh? <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, hats off to Mr. Kudlow for making the prediction. Uh, but anyway, he used to, uh, there's always a debate in economics as what is inflation? Um... And, you know, some people believe it's like consumer price indexes and the rising cost of business, blah, blah, blah. Others, like Mr. Kudlow, believe inflation is actually nothing more than a function of the velocity of money. And if you think about uh, my analogy right here, what would happen to prices in Vancouver, a relatively small market, if like, say, a hundred millionaires all came into the market starting to buy up the real estate market of course would be inflated and then of course there'd be a whole bunch of people coming in on the speculative side trying to flip houses in fact i was at my dentist the other day and the receptionist is like oh yeah well i'm in the real estate uh, speculation business too but shh, don't tell my boss and it's like oh my goodness this has got disaster written all over it um so you know, uh, speaking to Mr. Kudlow, uh, I can understand that the velocity of money within this small market here in Vancouver has just gone absolutely insane. Money, i.e., you know, $500,000 for a house, a million dollars for a house. As somebody on uh, Twitter today was uh, showing uh, $2 million for a little three-bedroom, two-bath piece of crap in Venice, California. And frankly speaking, actually, uh, in today's dollars, that actually isn't too bad. Because if you can have an address in Venice, that'd be pretty sweet. Uh, and the uh, the tragedy is, of course, that money itself, what the hell's the value of money? It's like collapsing as we speak. It's quite shocking. Bitcoin, 100,000. <laughs> I came out, um, I came out um, about a, a week ago, I made this outlandish statement on the, on the web, on the site. I was like, I mean, I can't see how Bitcoin cannot be a hundred thousand in this world. Like that's how it's gotten in my eyes. It's not really a question of if now. It's just really a question of when. I mean, like I said, uh, two two bedroom, uh, three bedroom piece of crap house is a couple million bucks. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm not quite sure why I went off on that tangent today, but here we are doing our broiler chicken show thing. I don't know, guys on YouTube, or did you did any of you enjoy that little rant there about <laughs> economics 101 and uh, the Chinese third market? <laughs> you don't hear anybody talk about the Chinese third market anymore. Um, and and you know that that's a story coming from the Cold War. What's fascinating is you don't hear anybody talk about the Cold War. 
We just had Marat come on the call, and he's in Germany. God, I don't hear anybody talking about East Germany anymore. Man, there used to be some wonderful stories. Remember Lac Luenza and uh, Poland and Solidarity and all that? Wow, I mean, how the world has changed. Still uh, waiting on my uh, Romanian buddy to, uh, uh, he's my uh, real estate agent in Transylvania. I totally want to get a castle in Transylvania. Wouldn't that be so awesome? <laughs> so uh, I haven't seen Dan on the uh, on the site lately. Uh, he's my Transylvanian real estate agent. I think that'd be so fun. And then I got two Brits. Mind you, they're totally slacking. Uh, but they're my uh, Bulgarian real estate agents. We're trying to get a couple of uh, condos. There. So that would be kind of cool to have sort of your your uh, your castle in Transylvania. And you have your winter uh, ski condos in Bulgaria. Wouldn't that be a cool life to live? <laughs> I think that would be hilarious. Uh, Oscar says, we came for the financial expertise, but stay for the Beamish effect. <laughs> Well, I don't know whether expertise, that's probably not a good word to use. Uh, I mean, all you guys know that all I, all I do is I just try my best. Um, am I an expert? No, nah, I don't think so. Um, I am, you know what I am is, um, I, I live a funny life in that I don't really have anything to live for. So every day of my life, I wake up and, uh, in fact, actually, I was even saying this in our, uh, in our lounge the other day. The only thing I lit wake up for is, uh, you know, try and tell the people that are in your life that you love them and you appreciate them. I think that's really important through 2020. Um, my son, and actually I have to say my son on balance, if you look at his life, and how it could have gone and where the direction he uh, he is set up to go uh, I think actually he's been extremely fortunate so I think he's in good hands um, and I've tried my absolute best uh, and Jojo and God know that to try and support him as best as I can um, and then really, you know, at the end of the day, really all that matters is can I come out and just make a positive difference in your guys' life? That's that's really the only thing that matters here. Um, I don't like the idea of labeling yourself as sort of better. You know what's interesting? Our level three program. Um, I actually, I tell them right off, right from the, the get-go, because actually in our level three program is the first time that students actually get to work directly with me. And I tell them right from the get-go that uh, you're no longer look at me as like a teacher or a lecturer. You are actually one of my peers. And, you know, if you fuck up in the trading like crude oil or S&P pits, I mean, there's not going to be anybody who's going to be like standing over you going, uh-uh-uh, you know, you can't do that. So in a weird sort of way, when we get to that level three, I actually want people to start taking personal responsibility that they're not really in a school anymore. They're actually in a real life environment. And uh, we're peers. We're here to help each other. And I'm going to give you a whole bunch of information that's going to help you because I know the hurdles that you're probably going to run into. But the only person that really can hold uh, you to account at the end of the day is yourself. So... Uh, as long as I can spend the rest of my life just doing those three things that I told you, try and you know, tell the people that are in my life that I'm super appreciative of them and I love them. Um, you know, take care of my son as absolutely best as I can and I think he's in a very good place. And at the end of the day, just you know, how can I help you guys? And I think that's actually why TRI's done well. Is because I don't think about money. Money to me doesn't mean anything. Um, I've got enough that I don't have to worry about money. And more importantly, I actually have enough so that I can demonstrate all these different fun trading plans to you guys. <laughs> I mean, the irony of it all is uh, <laughs> we were sitting, I think it was last week, we were sitting there going... Uh, you know, there's this fun sort of, I can't remember what the activity was, but it was going to cost a few thousand bucks. 
And then I was like, ah, oh, geez, you know, I'd much rather just go buy this really cool stock. <laughs> and it's got this cool chart pattern and everything, and I can talk in the public about it. And then that way you guys don't feel like I'm bullshitting you with, like, paper trading and stuff. But this is actually real money. So, ironically enough, that's the only, the only uh, you know, and that's really, ironically enough, how you should look at money. Is you got to have sort of your basic needs met. Um, and a good rule of thumb. And, you know, it's so sad because what I think is happening in this world is um, we are we have all basically turned into grasshoppers. So if you understand the ant and the grasshopper analogy. And now it's gotten to the point because so many of even the uh, more important people in our society have become grasshoppers then now we have the oh well this grasshopper is too big to fail but at the end of the day we're all grasshoppers and you know the easiest way to avoid all this nonsense is don't be a grasshopper but what I'm worried about here and what really bothers me is that our society these democratically elected government bodies have instilled this thinking that it's okay to be a grasshopper does that make sense what I'm saying um, you know big brother is going to bail you out and this is a really bad message that our society is sending because at some point look at the Soviet Union at some point the whole thing will stop it will end you don't know what it's going to look like, but usually it has to end in sort of some chaotic, uh, it could, you know, deteriorate into civil war. It might just be like sort of martial law kind of world, gangsters, thugs, you know, and the end result on nine times out of ten is somebody like uh, Napoleon, all right, French Revolution, perfect example. Uh, in this particular go-round, I think Mr. Putin uh, is very much like uh, the, the Napoleon. Let's hope Mr. Putin doesn't decide to go on the rampage uh, here, but, you know, only time will to hell. Uh, I think you... I don't know whether China is a good analogy for this, but what I was absolutely shocked to hear recently, did you guys hear recently that uh, within China they're going on a book-burning campaign? that uh, they're going to try and do another one of these cultural revolution things. Um, they basically, you know, they did the deal with the West. Um, you know, how that worked out in the end, I don't know. But I was, uh, I was a bit surprised to see that actually, wow, they might even go as far as sort of book burning. And, you know, if you are a Western person in China right now, oh boy, be careful. <clears throat> Um, yeah, well, and then there's also that. I mean, everybody throw in um, these big celestial events into the mix. And, you know, the long and short. I watched a really cool video last night, although I think I, I lost the, uh, I don't know what I lost. I think I still have it. But I uh, watched a really cool, yeah, this one here. Uh, really cool video shared to us by one of our site members, Landon. Totally fun. I have a feeling Landon's going to uh, make himself very comfortable here at TRI for quite a while. <laughs> but uh, he shared this video with us. Uh, crispy, that's right. <laughs> and what's really interesting, right, is I like uh, crisp setups. So it's fascinating. Uh, I think Landon's bought on to the idea of we trade setups. Uh, we uh, Everything should be crisp. You know, your location should be solid. Your divergence should look pristine. Your W should look like you should be able to eat off those. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were, uh, you know, level one, we were playing the uh, Sir Mix-A-Lot song. Uh, what does a good-looking W look like, you know? <laughs> so anyway... Um, you know, we have a funny uh, nickname. For some reason, Landon got the nickname Crispy. I don't even, I can't remember how it, it got that way. I think it was because he had a Q or something in his name when he first came on the site. And I couldn't I couldn't pronounce it. I was like, quick, 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 Crispy? <laughs> anyway, 
Anyway, he shared this cool video, um, and you know, I, I don't like playing other people's videos. YouTube shits all over your head if you uh, if you do that. So I, I, I'll just, I don't know whether I want to, everybody on the site landed and posted in the lounge, so check it out. But a really cool um, uh, video by a guy who's like maybe a little bit uh, deeper into the mysticism and stuff that uh, I go. Um, but um, fascinating perspective. Uh, and actually what's really cool is I think he's even, yeah, he's, uh, I get the feeling he's, uh, he's bet that crypto is, uh, going to go absolutely insane here in the next couple of years. And frankly speaking, I wouldn't surprise me one bit here, folks. Uh, everything is sort of set up for, you know, like all, a lot of these celestial events that he makes reference to and that we've been talking to about on the site. Hey, so Grog, you decided to come in and join us over here. Was the YouTube experience lacking? <laughs> I saw you over there. Now you're over here. Uh, oh, what are you saying over there? Brian needs met. What? Getting basic needs met is why I'm taking the course. Okay. Well, but you know, the sad part about it, Grog, is... Um, and I often tell a lot of our aspiring traders is you cannot look at trading as a way to meet your basic needs in the short term. You'd just be way too emotionally invested. It just won't work. I've never seen anybody be able to do it. So what actually has to happen, and uh, I think I've told you guys on YouTube this story before, and actually maybe we should move off of here so YouTube doesn't crap on me. Um, but uh, what often hap uh, what I uh, Gog, have you ever heard me tell you the story about the guy who learned how to trade candlestick patterns on the bus on the way to work? Or oh, Gog, you're over here now, aren't you? Um, you're gonna have to find some sort of nine to five. Um, wow, there's something. Uh, was that a Gog? Did Gog just officially announce his uh, presence? <laughs> anyway, um, you're going to have to find some sort of 9 to 5, whatever it be. It might be pumping gas. It might be flipping burgs at, burgers at Wendy's, whatever. You're going to have to, you have to have your nut met. You just don't have any choice. Um, and then my suggestion to you is, you know, just make sure your nut is met. And if you need to, print off a chart and drag your book across the chart and say what do I do now what do I do now what do I do now you have to practice 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 till you get absolutely bulletproof at this then maybe go take like five ten percent of your paycheck from uh, McDonald's or Wendy's or whatever you're doing to make sure your nut is mad and the great part about crypto is you can start getting in there and applying this stuff in the crypto market for very little dollars um, and, you know, like I showed you that last cycle, you happen to catch the market at the right time. You happen to know what's kind of to be expected going forward. You can turn a very small amount of money into a hell of a lot of money very quickly. And then bye-bye McDonald's, bye-bye gas station. Uh, I now have a, my nut covered with my steak. And then away you go. So uh, I don't know whether that helps you, Gog, but really, honestly, that's what you probably got to do if you're starting from absolute scratch is you got to make sure that your nut is covered uh, and then uh, start building your education and then uh, start putting a little bit of money to work in the market, applying the principles you've learned in your education, trade your plan, trade your setups, obey risk management, don't have opinions, opinions are worthless trade your setups and then just let that money grow um okay anyway uh wow that sure was another crazy rant sorry everybody i know uh, kevin and really the whole purpose of these videos here today and you know i'm sure i'm gonna get a bunch hey look at that i already got a couple uh, down votes <laughs> you mentioned i mean it's so terrible in this world i would be willing to bet that if i just mentioned uh, China and totalitarianism, boom, downvote, 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 downvote. Uh, how about the, uh, the T word? Do I dare say the T word? <laughs> uh, 
I mean, I, I actually, the feedback that I've gotten from a lot of people on the site is, uh, to hell with the stupid downvotes and stuff, Brian. It's it's a joke. So, um, I don't even know that I really even want to uh, acknowledge uh, all that silly social media nonsense. But, like I said, the point I'm here is, can I help you? Through all this crap and listening to all the people that come on the site that I have helped, uh, how much are you paying for this information on YouTube right now? You know, that that's that's you guys. I mean, I just, I'm here to help. If I can help, and if there's something that I say, and you're like, wow, I never heard that before, then mission accomplished. Anyway. Okay, so big part of today's class, uh, well, class, that's not right. Well, today's class for the level oneers was <clears throat> starting to work with... Uh, price momentum oscillators and indicators to show us what markets in divergence looks like. Um, and specifically, we introduced them to my favorite um, um, price uh, momentum divergence tool to use is the MACD histogram. Um, I don't really recommend people to use uh, indicators right out of the box, i.e. you just go to your charting platform and you uh, hit indicator and you go, all right, um, you know, <laughs> now that chart's not even going to work. That's a whole conversation unto itself. Actually, I think, well, I've got this over here. So uh, let's, these are the questions that people ask. And really, to all intents and purposes, a big uh, part of this conversation today is going to be exactly what I'm showing you here. Um, so let's uh, maybe move that up there. And, uh, well, I guess this is fine. Um, so uh, as I said, and, and what I really would like is I would like for the students in the level one program to just be absolutely blitzed with support where they're just getting it out the yin yang. You got the lectures which are hours long. You've got uh, TAs and you know our TAs they're beautiful people. I mean you in level one right now just get to know Kevin and get to know Joshua. These people are so awesome. It's ridiculous. Um, I mean, it's a privilege just knowing these people. That alone is a, an awesome gift. And I'll tell you, keep an eye on, on Joshua. I mean, uh, the guy's a scripting genius. And uh, he's basically built out a bunch of scripts that as soon as Seward's ready for him, oh my goodness, our algos are just going to go nuts. So uh, keep on keeping on, Shark Toshi. Uh, as soon as Seward's ready for you, and he's just about there. He's so close. Uh, you two uh, should just start rocking it. Um, Graham, of course. Jeez, what a great guy. Did a great, great class today. Um, and um, as, it, as you can see on the screen, this is the modified uh, MACD indicator that I like to use um, to help me see that message of divergence. Uh, so this was really the big sort of focus of today's class. Um, and I uh, wanted to sort of spend some time, and I think there was a question. Uh, let's see. Show a few more uh, examples of confirmed versus potential MACD divs. So like I said, while they were going through the class, I just pulled up the, 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 uh, the Bitcoin chart here over the past uh, you know, few weeks, and uh, this was such a beautiful example of, um, of, of uh, divergence simply saying, look at, uh, well, actually, you know the best way to describe this? Uh, think uh, Josh's ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and I remember to say the ex. So, Josh, if you're around, um, I got it right. <laughs> so everybody on the site should get a chuckle from that, although I didn't see too any reactions. Is Josh here? Josh is such a sweetie. He's another guy. Oh, my goodness. Just beautiful people. And uh, Josh has a nice YouTube feed where basically it's all the same concepts and stuff. So uh, I think I actually highlighted on the TRI uh, page. Yeah, there you are over there. So uh, here is your girlfriend. And if anything, um, divergence is actually a really great way to sort of uh, get a message from the market that hey maybe we're not really going anywhere in a big hurry or maybe we are going but okay we've set the base now we have to see a little bit more 
structure to help us flame, frame expectations. Structure never comes in, and as a result, it's big hurry up and do nothing. So actually, this image here is a really great testament to this violently flat market state, uh, where we just keep going back from bull and um, so. Uh, before I get into that, I just want to acknowledge that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then, uh, good evening, Brian. How are you? Oh, I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, I get to see Liam here in a few hours, so that's always uh, a good thing. Looking at the BCS, and I'm wondering, how do you screen your VCIM stocks? Well, you remember, this was taught to me by an old floor broker. So uh, it's difficult to find these stock names. There's no doubt about it. Is there a particular way to set up Finviz? No, because this is the uh, venture cap investment model that was based on the Canadian stock market. So uh, Finviz only does US stocks. So technically, no. It's just the simple answer is no. Um, <clears throat> uh, the way that I like to screen for these names is, um, I think I've said this story to you guys before. Uh, back in, um, geez, I guess, I think it was about 97, 98. So even maybe before some of you were even a twinkle in mom and dad's eyes. Um, there was a really bad scandal in the uh, Canadian gold market with a company called Briex. Uh, and it turns out that they had quote unquote salted their cores. So any of you mining engineers out there, when you hear the term salting, uh oh, that's a bad sign. So uh, after and and uh, the Canadian investment industry, uh, the Canadian pension funds, the Canadian regulators, were all made to look extremely foolish through all of it. And if it's one thing technocrats do not like, they do not like to be made look foolish. So as a result, uh, in Canada, any company that's deemed a venture capital company, um, they have to report, um, and especially if you're in the resource business, gold mining, oil, whatever, you have to report technical reports that actually meet a whole bunch of qualifications. And you actually have to have like industry experts actually sign off and attest to the validity of the data. Um, and all the directors have to sign off on every document that's disseminated so that if anybody does anything like Briex again, they can point the fingers and say it's his fault, it's their fault, whatever. Uh, remember, bureaucrats, they do not like to be made look foolish. Um, so as a result, and this is, this is a great um, um, <clears throat> how do you say this? Sometimes regulation and government and um, uh, everything that the capitalists hate, sometimes it's actually a good thing for us little fish. Remember, big fish, 1%, they don't want any of their information disseminated. So, of course, they want smaller government, get out of my business. I don't, you know, we are a monopoly. We want to control this industry. We do not want the public to know what we're doing. And we want to just keep going making shitloads of money and fleecing the public, whatever. Um, I, You know, you could make the argument to a certain degree that maybe there's quite a bit of that in crypto as well. This whole space is technically unregulated. I have to say that once they listed those CME futures contracts which were regulated, this space sure got a hell of a lot of religion, eh? I mean, literally the moment after that happened, then all the Vander Holly fields and stuff were all... Remember that guy, uh, that, uh, who's that, 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 that karate guy who turned cop? Um, he got involved in cryptocurrencies and all that kind of stuff. Man, all those people are gone now, eh? 
So, ironically enough, it's probably a good thing for the industry that uh, we get a little bit of regulation in here to clean up all the nefarious characters. But anyway, that's here nor there. Um, point is that asking with regard to VCIM, I go to sites like this. This is the T. It's the Toronto Stock Exchange. Sort of, they set up this uh, public portal website. But the point here is they have great sort of stock screening information. So I wouldn't go, and the interesting thing is, is you can actually do a lot of your U.S. screening. See, they have NYSE, NASDAQ, all U.S. exchanges. So you can actually go to a, a site like this and do all of your U.S. screen, uh, all of your U.S. Uh, stock screening. But this one actually helps me uh, see the venture capital stocks. So typically what I'll do here, and keep in mind, the VCIM, and really I would argue all good investments, there's one key element to all really good sort of speculative investments. One key, one key only. And that is the supply of the investment. I would probably make the argument that half of the reason why Bitcoin did as well as it did was strictly because the supply is limited. Um, once you start tinkering around with supply, I mean, you saw the shit coins. You saw what happened to them. A lot of them, fuck, a lot of them pre-mine the shit out of them. I mean, just totally fleece the public. So if you want a way to sort of keep yourself honest in this, uh, in this game, always be focused on supply. And here I can do a quick little screen where I can ask things like, you know, they got a whole bunch of different screen stuff here. But, you know, the simplest one I want to know, and especially if I'm doing VCIM, I'll do like the Venture Exchange. Let's say we're doing, you know, basic uh, materials. We'll look for commodities. Um, what I want to look for here is, um, what the hell is it? Of course, you'll never find it when you want to find it. Uh, shares outstanding and really ideally I want you know how many uh, it'd be a good question who knows how many coins outstanding are on Bitcoin right now so why don't we say in our screen rolling and invest in ideas that mean the same criteria that Bitcoin has, because damn that Bitcoin investment, it was solid. So why don't we why don't we use the same kind of number screen? I mean, there, it's not an accident that it just so happens Bitcoin has this number of coins out, right? It's not an accident. And it, you know, in our level one program, we teach can slam, which you can do on something like VC uh, the uh, Finviz site, because it is. US. Um, one of the key criteria of CanSlim is low shares out. I mean, this is so important, people. You really have to understand this. So, the point I would just say is why don't we start our screen with we will not consider a stock that has more than 25 million shares out. Now we're just going to run the screen. You saw I did that. All that was was basic materials. So, did it just kick out? Sometimes it does this. Oh, you know what? Uh, this is on uh, Brave. <laughs> Warning, you can't do this screen on Brave. It won't work. <laughs> Talk about, I mean, not only do we have to try and, you know, figure our way through this uh, crazy thing called the Internet um, and all these different platforms and stuff, but it turns out some stuff works on some uh, web browsers and some stuff doesn't work on others. It drives you crazy. Uh, welcome to the 21st century. So here is, um, uh, I don't need to be in there. Here is, uh, uh, Chrome's version. Oh, geez, what did, let's try that again. Um, so, and I suppose we could go all U.S. exchanges and you want to just start. I want to look in basic materials, um, you know, commodities, that kind of stuff. And just get rid of all these. And you want to just start with, I'm only going to consider stocks that have less than, tw oops, uh, I don't want that. Shares outstanding. 
less than uh, 25 million out. I mean, this will actually give you a list, and you can see there's not that many, 38 results found. So this is where I would start sort of my, um, my search, something along these lines. Uh, and then you would, and you know, this happened to be US, of course, uh, the VCIM, um, it's very difficult to get this information on US companies. A lot of these companies, you know, again, it's like, do you like big government? Do you like small government? Uh, in the United States, you've collectively decided that they would prefer smaller government. And then also too, and this is where it gets really awkward, Securities licensing is actually done on a state by state basis. So if you're an advisor or you're anything with regard to that, it's all individual states. Like if I was a broker and I wanted to sell stock into the states, I had to go and get a goddamn license in every single state I wanted to uh, sell. I even talk to somebody in that state, had to have a license in that state. So you can imagine trying to appeal to the entire country. Pfft. I mean, and you hopefully you understand based because of that, the securities industry is incredibly fractured in the United States. Canada, we take a little different approach. Uh, obviously, Canada is incredibly bureaucratic, very you know technocrat, you might call it. Big Brother. In fact, if you leave it up to Big Brother, they don't want you involved in the market at all they would actually prefer that you just go to your bank, buy your mutual fund, buy your registered product, be a good citizen, pay your taxes, get the fuck out of the market, right? You're gonna go buy your RSP index fund, mutual fund product that you're gonna get raped on on fees, but so what? You're a good Canadian, you're doing what you're told. Um, having said that, this is kind of like Chinese B market. <laughs> I think to a certain degree, they can't really shut Canadians out of speculating and actually wanting to buy uh, venture cap stock. I think it's just too ingrained in our society, especially out here in the Western Canada, because uh, we're, we're very, very much Wild West. Um, so having said that, there are tools. And like I said, I was taught this model by an old VSC floor broker this isn't the kind of information you're ever going to get, you know, from like, um, you know, come to our seminar tonight to learn how to trade your TD Ameritrade account. You'd never hear this from them. Or, uh, you know, uh, learn the, th the, the, the three secrets to uh, saving for your retirement brought to you by Charles Schwab. You'd never hear this kind of talk from them. This is like floor broker shit, right? And really, ironically enough, if I told Chris that I was actually telling you guys this, he'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? Don't give away our industry secrets. <laughs> but like I said, I don't care. I've got nothing to live for. I've got nothing to die for too, which is a cool kind of thing. I'm just here trying to make a positive difference in your guys' lives. <laughs> Thank you, Chris Forehead. Yeah, everybody, and you know, poor old Chris, last time I talked to him, he was in a senior's home and he could barely remember me and, you know, sadly, uh, you know, Alzheimer's was kicking in. So, you know, if anything, let's let's all make Mr. Forehand famous. You know, let's call it the VCIM Forehand model. We should, we owe it to Chris. It's not Beamish. Don't label it Beamish. Right? In fact, all the setups on the site, I specifically give them names, not Beamish, because I don't have any, um, you know, any, oh, I don't have any equity in this, but I don't have any ego in it either. I like to name setups like the Davo and like Krispy Kreme here. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to make Landon famous. And he never even dreamed that he was going to be called Krispy Kreme for the rest of his life. <laughs> I mean, talk about a fucking curveball out of nowhere. <laughs> oh, Peter, what's your setup? We got to make you famous too. Anyway, Brian the crazy idiot. So uh, to answer your question specifically, and what I like to do is then I'll come in here and I'll edit the, uh, the columns. And you know, there are a lot of like, I actually, um, I actually saw recently, and I'll just uh, do this up relatively quickly. 
Um, and you, you are, you know, you can get this. Whoever asked this question, you can get this link in the library, TMX website. Uh, we got the links all over the library. Um, but um, you know, so I'll just do something really simple just to show you. Um, and then we'll go shares outstanding. And what I, you know, what I actually like to do is I like to, um, I like to ask how close these stocks are trading relative to their book value per share. So price to tangible book ratio. And really, what I want to do is I really want to concentrate on uh, stocks that have low share counts out. I don't need market cap; that's irrelevant to me. I want to know low shares out, and I want to see that the assets trading at a discount to. If you took all the company's assets and lined them up, and just marked them, mark them, and just liquidated it, right at market, assuming you could get a fill. Um, what is the value of the asset right now in the marketplace relative to what that number is? And that's in essence price to book. Um, and really what we're asking here is, uh, is the asset trading at a discount to book value? If I can find this scenario, low shares out, trading relatively near the bottom end of its range, we can do a 50% rule pretty quick looking at this data. And I see that the stock is trading below book. Well, then at that point, so like like I said, so we're going to save that. Then we'll look at the uh, results. I guess that's what this is. 175 names. That's a lot. Right? And you can see there's lots of companies to choose from. 12 million, 16 million, 23 million, 19 million, 5 million, 10 million. But at least now you have a universe of sort of acceptable stocks to look at. So what we do is we take this uh, step one uh, further and we create a nice little spreadsheet. Um, and you know, with the help of things like Google Finance, you can actually build a spreadsheet that basically updates on its own. So this would sort of be the next step is I'm just gonna cut and paste the list. Uh, just a cute little script. I mean, it's not rocket science, super, super simple. You can create cute little scripts. Remember, we asked for 52-week high, 52-week low, number of shares out, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you can do little scripts to calculate what the current 52-week range, 50% level. Now, this number here is being reported incorrectly. That's not a correct 50% level. Just FYI, but you know that's here and there. Um, you can see most of these are pretty uh, accurate and realistic. When you see a number like this, 1,300%, you got to go, hey, well, is that really real? Uh, John just die that kind of stuff. Anyway, point of the matter here is um, I now have 50% rule and then again I can do a simple uh, script that's just going to tell me well current price is like three cents a share. You can see the 52 week high is 28, 52 week low is 2, so 50% level is 15. How many multiples of let's say I little old lady this, I'm just going to buy the stock at three, how many doubles could I get on a move just back to the 50% rule? Well, it turns out I can get four. Uh, I guess that's right. Uh, is that 4x? Three to 15? I guess that would be more like uh, five, wouldn't it? Uh, I'm not quite sure. 5x. So uh, even our math and actually, let's see. Oh, I've rounded it. So it's not exactly uh, five. So you can see I've rounded the number, and what the hell? You might as well you might as well be consistent and conservative, eh? So at this point now, I can go and you know the great part about it is if you just cut and paste that list, notice all the links are all right in here. So I could just click on the link and go, okay, let's see, uh, let's learn a little bit more about this company. And then you just simply go through the level one course, grab all of the criteria. And just go through and just, oh, gee whiz, is that one of the criteria in our uh, model that we're kind of interested in? Um, and really, all you got to do is just go, and, oh, how about share consolidation? Isn't that kind of something that we're interested in? And, and, you know, the irony of it all is that once you start seeing all that criteria fall into place, then what you want to do and notice... Uh, I thought it was, I mean, this is such a great example of the rubber meets the road. Um, uh, where's our list? Uh, oh, yeah, I remember it was over on this thing. Um, and I don't know whether it's in here. There's a lot of names. But I'll show you the spreadsheet. 
So this was sort of our filtered uh, list. And uh, there was one that popped up here recently, this guy. Um, and what should happen here is now you've got a vetted fundamental list. We want to be rational investors. Okay, well, these are great fundamentals, and you could just go buy them. What usually happens if you go and buy a really good fundamental idea, but the technical picture is kind of meh? What can happen to a fundamental investor? And actually, this is part of the level one course. So does everybody remember back to eating your vegetables? Bet you done. <laughs> Not many of you do. I mean, you can sit underwater for a very long period of time. Is uh, It doesn't necessarily mean that the asset's going off the board. Um, it could be undervalued, but it might just sit there undervalued for quite a, a long period of time. What happens if we actually start combining some of the fun technical analysis stuff that we've learned on a list like this? So when these things are technically ready to go, does it make sense that these things can go absolutely apeshit? Does that make sense? And you know, the proof of the pudding's in the eating. You know, it's interesting when I when I first learned about this and Chris showed me some of the stocks that he made money on doing this. And you're kind of like, uh, you know, that's great. You know, it doesn't really resonate with you. It's sort of like, yeah, I hear what you're saying. But, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I'll tell you, when you're in a trade like this, this is a weekly chart, and of course I came in down here, and you're in names like this that do this? <laughs> I tell you. I mean, this is why you're here, is you want to try and get in when it's not mooning. And then you're nice and comfortably in at the bottom. And, of course, when it does moon, what are we doing at TRI? Are we buying into this? And keep in mind, trying to identify this shit in the stock market is damn difficult. I mean, it was really easy there a few years ago when the crypto market was in absolute insane bull market. You could buy almost anything and make money. Uh, I do see that in the crypto market, and I hear this all the time, that uh, people are just expecting the whole fucking market to lift. And they just buy anything and the whole market goes up. But I don't think we're in that kind of crypto environment right now. We are in identify good stories, and those good stories will kill, you know, big, broader benchmarks. Is it, and somebody just said, uh, what was that point there? Can you find little old lady setups all year round or is it seasonal? So, you know, that's actually a really good point, but I don't think, Ewald, you understand what you're saying. I, I'd be curious, um, YouTubers, let's see if YouTubers, I'm sure the people in the lounge are going to help you here, Ewald. Would we use the term little old lady setup does that actually sound right according to all of beamish's crazy language no i'm sorry you old but you do have to understand that that's that's not a setup and that's that's you know sadly for the crypto space they really got derailed because somebody came along and bastardized that expression and really, I don't think did the community a huge favor by doing that. They really should have just named the setup something on their own, called it a completely unique name. Uh, because we've run into a huge, um, it's almost like some people think the little old lady means a very specific action in the market. When this, 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 and happens, you do that. But uh, everything that I teach about uh, risk management 
you have to understand from my perspective why I called it Little Old Lady. It is a way of approaching managing your money in the marketplace where you don't really have to think too much about things like getting stopped out or margin calls or um, you know uh, seeing half your account disappear because of, uh, the idea went belly up um, and understanding that you are simply going to liquidate positions should they double in value so that uh, you you are always playing from a, pos a position of strength. So, quote unquote, little old lady, and I'd really like for level oneers to get this very firmly in their head. That is a, a type of risk manager. Now, could you use the little old lady risk management approach to investing in VCIM names? Absolutely. Yeah, and as Colleen says here, I mean, if you want to build a setup around using that little old lady concept on the site, we have a little, uh, well, we have a model called Nanny Nibbles. Okay, that's a Define setup implementing the little old lady risk management strategy. Love it. Perfect. So, Ewald, does that make sense what I just said there? Because it's super important that you get this and get it now. And I will wait for your reply. Okay. Good. Super important. So, could you little old lady this? Sure. Could you Joe six pack this? Sure. Could you margin trade this? Yeah, but I wouldn't recommend margin trading penny stocks. That's just asking for trouble. <laughs> Could you uh, derivatives trade this? No, there are no futures contracts on things like penny stocks. Um, there might be warrants, but I would actually l look at the warrant as an equity play. Um, and that would be things like Little Old Lady, Joe Sixpack, Margin Trader. And I really do not like the idea of buying a warrant on margin. That's just asking for even more trouble. <laughs> Mind you, uh, we do have one uh, warrant expert on the site, Kvarkinator. Maybe he might consider it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But it's beautiful. I, again, I love, you know what? I love opening up the different parts of the market to uh, to site members and, and students. You know, like if, when I first came to TRI and uh, taught this and built the education program out, of course, it was like 99% crypto. And it was a lot of fun opening up these new, brand new windows and possibilities. And I got to tell you, I think a lot of these guys, they're just so enamored with the warrants right now. They can't believe that the vehicles in the stock market, they trade like this. I mean, they're just all over the place. But what the hell, right? I mean, uh, just like when the shit coins pump 10x, 100x, can these warrants do the same thing? Sure. Why not? Um, okay, so... Uh, Th that what I wanted to show you here was a name that's just getting going right off the list now. Right? I showed you, uh, you know, and me personally, uh, the ones that are in teal, I have bought. The ones uh, that are in pink or whatever this color is, they're actually from a previous cycle that I'm already long and already sold free stock on. So they're basically free positions. So it's interesting how this one still is in the screener of possibilities. This screen's actually 50 million or less. So. Uh, <coughs> um, and then the green ones are the ones that actually I'd like to, uh, I'm just hunting, trying to get in. So you can see this guy, I'm already long. Um, and w the point I wanted to try and make was this was our fundamentally screened ideas. So this is our universe of sort of acceptable names. Then we're going to go and apply a little bit of technical analysis to our uh, idea and try and time our purchases a little bit better. 
and hopefully everybody sees this on uh, on on the site and you know basically all you youtubers you should look at this and go and do the same old shit that I keep seeing from him where all I'm gonna do is just hunt W's and in this case uh, you know you get you level oneers just did um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so as Omar uh, suggests everybody uh, yeah this is free information I mean I'm giving you the secrets of the market here if you actually learn this shit, like record this, watch this video like a hundred times over, I'm giving you seriously a fucking cash cow here for the rest of your life. But I doubt many people will, Omar. This is edutainment, right? And look at that. We just got a, a thumbs down. <laughs> See, Omar? You, if you fall into that trap, and I hate this crap with YouTube, it's a, it's a stupid vortex of like... You know, uh, it's like the high school cafeteria bullshit, you know. In fact, it would be really nice if we could just get rid of that stupid thumbs up, thumbs down. Look at that. Somebody else just did a thumbs down. I mean, what a joke this is, right? It's it's stupid. I'm literally giving you guys the secrets of capitalism here, and people have the audacity to thumbs down this. What a joke. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, like I, maybe, you know what, might be a good idea, guys. What do you think? Should we maybe just turn these Sunday broiler chicken shows private? You know, I, I think actually that's not a bad idea. I think I've had enough dealing with the public anymore. You want to come and learn this stuff? Actually join the site. Ah, look at you guys are all like, yeah, yeah, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> anyway, so here's a great example of, um, of, uh, Fundamentally screened idea, and now I'm just going to apply a little bit of technical timing. Um, and, I mean, you see, the interesting thing is, look how quickly, it, I mean, just think about this, people. Just think about this. How often do you just go out and see an opportunity where you can double your money just like that? I mean, think about this. Start... <laughs> They're contemplating, you know, a quarter of a percent return on a risk-free rate. Uh, what's mutual fund returns? Here is an illustration where you double your money. Double your money from this level to this level. Is that doable? Is it realistic? Well, I actually think this is a perfectly realistic level. Do you see how easy that is? So if you can screen these ideas... If you can exercise a little bit of patience and discipline, you can actually be handed very substantial rates of return in very short periods of time. Now, this is a weekly price chart. You want to see what the daily chart looks like? It's ridiculous. <laughs> is that a bull market? <laughs> you tell me. Now, I mean, this is also a great analogy of... Um, of um, it, it, is this market maybe in a particular part of the market, the bigger market, where they're going a little bit stupid right now? Do you see the similarities between you know, a fiat currency system and gold price? And Hey, you listen to that Peter Schiff guy? <laughs> What's so funny is I, I could probably, if you sat down with like a portfolio of $100,000 and I just sit and trade these little penny gold stocks uh, all around him at the very end of the reporting period, I bet you the rates of returns would just be staggeringly different. <laughs> well, what can you do? Anyway, point of the matter here is, uh, and you tell me, at this point here, um... Well, maybe, maybe Bob, we should teach him uh, this VCIM model. What do you think? I mean, do you see what sector this, this, this is in? I mean, is this an accident? What's going on right now? I don't think so. You know, and you know, the funny part about this uh, between you and me, I actually know the one of the principles from my former career in the stock market, uh, Sean Chin. He's one of the primary promoters of this. That he. He used to work in the brokerage house. In fact, his office was just down the way from uh, the guys. Uh, remember the guy I used to tell you he'd turn the lights off, uh, lock his door, and hide under his desk when the credit control clerk would come by? I think I told you guys that story, right? So uh, this guy, the guy who's running this stock, uh, his office was just down the way. It was around the corner, Sean Chen. And it was so funny. You go into Sean's office. 
And it's an absolute fucking disaster. <laughs> it's so typical broker. Like, what's so funny is you guys, I, I'm sure all of you in the public, you have sort of this mental image of what a big bad broker is like in the market. And the, and the reality of it is probably so far different than what you actually think. And when they actually are dealing with clients face-to-face -face and stuff like that, they put on their pretty face and the makeup and the suits and stuff like that. But in reality, you'd be surprised what the inside of a broker's office looks like. <laughs> so anyway. Okay, so uh, long story short, um, I do believe that the principals that are running this stock, they're doing nothing more than taking advantage of an opportunity here. I think that's exactly what's going on. Um, and as you can see, uh, I'll be more than happy uh, to actually start paying myself for my hard effort. And frankly speaking, I'm probably going to be filled here probably Monday, Tuesday. I mean, look at the head of steam this thing's got behind it, right? So once I get my free position, get my original capital back in my hands, and literally I'm just going to take the stock and throw it on the pile, just like I did with all those silly altcoins last cycle, and I'm doing the same thing in the stock market, and my pile of stocks is starting to reach the moon again. Um, and I just keep doing the same damn thing over and over and over. So a really good uh, dovetail to my profession, the way I run my small business of trading, the uh, juxtaposition of pretty good fundamental screening data a low share count, recently consolidated, directors are loaded up, uh, uh, any indebtedness has been relieved, um, project is in the go, uh, and go. Um, coupled with, so that's the fundamentals, coupled with just wait for the good technical setups and really, you know, this is your trade. And everybody should look at this chart and go, yeah, gee whiz, look at the Ws. What a surprise Brian is buying. I mean, it really shouldn't surprise anybody. I'll tell you, when these Ws come in on ramping volume like this, oh, Nelly. <laughs> you know, the irony of all this is we do have, I think I, uh, I mentioned it in public uh, videos recently, we have kind of a fun challenge. Uh, with one site member because he's he wants to you know be famous 10x all that kind of stuff So we have a fun challenge on the site that we're gonna buy these VCIMers, but for this one portfolio this one plan We're only gonna sell uh, at uh, 10x <laughs> So I'm wondering now the original plan was I have to follow my plan do this so I don't think I'm gonna include this one in it um, but uh, but uh, Josh and I will probably have an example, um, sort of little uh, trading plan going forward because he does little YouTube videos. So I really would like to see him report that plan uh, through his YouTube videos. And we're going to demonstrate how you take like five hundred dollars and buy a Tesla with five hundred bucks, which frankly speaking, I think is totally doable. It's just you have to be very patient and very slow and disciplined. Okay, so sure hope that answered that question. Um, you know, how, how do you Americans uh, screen for this kind of information? Um, it's going to be damn difficult. Start with your shares outstanding screen. Usually you can get most of those. Then uh, you're going to have to dig through companies news releases. It's not easy. Uh, in the States, it's very difficult to get options to directors and shares for debt information. But it is out there. I mean, you maybe have to pour through 10Q statements, stuff like that, or uh, I think that's the name of them. Um, in Canada, makes it a little easier to do the analysis. So uh, it's actually easier to screen for this. And honestly, Gog, I have no idea about UK. Really, all I'm going to do is give you the criteria. It's up to you to try and figure out how to find the information. Maybe you give the company a call. You know, you can always call the company up. Okay, so I'm hearing people squawking about Bitcoin. Is it moving all over the place here? A Bitcoin! Well, it's not really moving. You guys get all excited. Um, <coughs> you know, I think probably the easiest message I should uh, give you guys is uh, actually what I, I tweeted out earlier today. 
Because frankly speaking, I think, you know, for the public, this actually is pretty simple. It's just, it's going to drive you nuts if you watch the screen 24-7. It's literally going to drive you crazy. Um, but I would make the argument, and you hopefully you've seen this time and time again from me, that really, you know, regardless of wherever we top out here, you just simply want to force yourself. I'm only allowed to buy at or below reload zones. I mean, it just keeps you out of a lot of trouble. I'll tell you, it really does. Um, so, you know, if I, if I was looking, and this is basically what I said earlier today, if somebody just came up to me and said, uh, Brian, you know, you... I'm um, thinking about hiring you as my financial planner. And keep in mind, I used to be licensed to do all that crap. Uh, but I'm really interested in investing some uh, some of my money and my uh, retirement account into this crazy thing called Bitcoin. Uh, I heard the fundamental story is not so bad. Yeah, I did hear we're trading a bit higher than what the uh, cost of production is. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if price had to come back a little bit. You know, if you were going to advise me what to do, what would you suggest? Um... Uh, I do, right? And my answer would be, well, from a technical perspective, um, I will just simply uh, draw, use this Fibonacci retracement tool that tells you 61.8% of the previous move to 78.6% of the previous move. This is what I call my reload zone. Um, I would just simply say, let's wait till we see a uh, price get back into this zone. Then we will look at things like internal measures of things like price momentum, uh, buying interest, uh, the you know the, the the who's in control of the market, the bulls or the bears, um, hunt for signs of things like divergence. Um, and then, of course, finally, when we are in good location, do I have signs from the uh, market itself that, hey, I actually want to go up. Not down, but up. And those are things like Ws. Remember I showed you that uh, little penny stock. What does this stock look like that wants to go up? I don't want to go down anymore. I want to go up. Usually, they have higher lows and higher highs. And if you see that on volume, <laughs> oh boy. Sarah! <laughs> Sarah over there on YouTube goes, Brian! <laughs> so, what? <laughs> did I miss something? Did I say something bad? <laughs> what did I say, Landon? It's got Sarah all upset. More downvotes. I bet you Sarah there, she, she just downvoted me. <laughs> Show up. Um, okay, so, you know, going back to the, the Bitcoin story. Um, you know, this is what I tweeted out earlier today. If anything, it's such a great analogy um, on, on balance. And I'd just be curious to see if any of the YouTubers know this. Uh, on balance, how often do markets trend versus ranging? Anybody know? Anybody know? Screw them down voters. Tell me about it. Well, what's what's up with Sarah? Why why is Sarah down voting me? Now, uh oh, oh Jesus, what did I say? Oh Nelly, here Bob's got a sound bite for you, everybody. Ready? Here we go. When these W's come in on ramping volume like this, oh Nelly. <laughs> when these W's come in. That's great, Bob. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Uh, B2. B, hey, B2's done pretty good. Uh, I think he's mined the shit out of this YouTube channel. <laughs> Way to go, B2. <laughs> I think that's one guy who's actually gotten pretty good value for his free money spent. <laughs> Illuminati. Uh-oh, what? I got to watch out for them behind me? Is that what you're saying, Sarah? I don't know. All right, so point of the matter here is, um, you know, at, at present, I would just simply take my fib tool. I would drag it up. My hunch is probably 38.2 is going to line up with this low here. And really, it's just a question of are we basing for another move higher? In my opinion, doubtful. 
uh, or are we going to have to go through very natural correction of this uh, up move? Keep in mind, you know, uh, there's an old expression that bottoms very rarely look like V's, and that looks like a big honking V. So that's that's bothersome to me. This this here and the whole stock market, everything just looks like a big V straight up. And you know, we the expression on the site is V's like V bottoms like to be tested. So doesn't surprise me one bit. And you know, I'm a big fan of candle body lows for trade location. So that level right there jumps out at me, and that level right there jumps out at me. So that, and you'll notice there's some funny little gappy action right in that candle right there. So you know, like I said, if somebody just in the public said, "Hey Brian, I'm thinking about buying some Bitcoin," I'd say, "Okay, I'll go throw some stinky bids in down below here, and let's see if you get lucky." Right now, uh, there it's. You know, we did get this cute little W that came in here recently, but oh, I hate, I hate, hate, hate when you get these cute little Ws that are like, okay, yeah, I'm a bull, I'm a bull, but right in the face of this big M-ish structure, right up at top end of the trading range. Oh God, that kind of stuff makes me sick to my stomach. There's going to be people that are going to take shots here and you know, it's a trader's life. It might work. I'm not really here to get into the business of uh, making predictions. That's not my job. My job is to try and identify, is this a high probability area or a low probability area? And if I do take my shot here, based on all the information that I'm getting from the market, is it a high probability that uh, I'm going to make money on this trade or is it a relatively low probability? That's, ironically enough, that's the only job of a, a, a trader is to try and figure out probabilities. Uh, and just looking at this and being in this uh, business for a very, very long time, and of course I'm probably going to be wrong, but just looking at this, the probability that we trade down into this area, in my opinion, is higher than the probability that we're actually going to move higher in earnest above here. What I'm worried about in the short term, though, is in a weird sort of way, this is now also kind of open air up here. And, you know, Brian talking about candle bodies for awesome trade location. I worry whether there's could be you know a nice little fuck you up in here, um, just to wash out any of the weak hands because we have been going one directional for quite a while. You know what this this all screams to me one very simple message: violently flat. We could be all over the place here over the next month or two. Um, and, you know, the worst part about it is if somebody, you know, who sort of doesn't know what the hell's going on and comes to you as a professional <clears throat> and you tell them, oh, yeah, sure, great idea to go and invest your hard-earned money here. And they come back to you, and if we do dump down here, and they come back to you later on and say things, well, the cost of production of this commodity was down here. And all of the technical analysis that you teach in your education program says you're not allowed to buy unless we're down here. How did you, uh, in good consciousness, tell me that this was a good buy here? So that that's the situation I'm in as a professional uh, right now. I don't think this is a good buy, but so what? <laughs> it's just my professional opinion. I mean, I've been playing this game a while, but that doesn't mean I'm, I'm a, I, I can predict the future. So that's sort of the position that I'm left in. I'll tell you, I do have some puts on the books. Um, I, I've been I'm trying to get some more puts on things like um, um, Ethereum. <laughs> it's been driving me crazy here. Um, I think I said recently, I think it last, and actually, you know, this is a really good example of sort of what ends up happening in really shitty trade location. You start saying, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. 
the market just goes wah, 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 and whatever you said five hours ago becomes meaningless um, and I seem to remember last weekend I was uh, I you know it's this chart uh, where the hell is it oh come on you're around here somewhere I know you are no nope, not that one not that one where are you oh darn <sighs> where did I put it there this one you know this weekly chart just looks horrible to me <laughs> you know that's sort of you know 50 percent. if mr gan was happy we should be down here at 7100 and he's still got another week or two to go here to be satisfied i mean that would be funny if we just <laughs> crapped out here not making any predictions i don't know what the fuck's gonna happen as you can see you know reload zone kind of thinking you can see where i'm sort of anticipating we could have a nice counter trend rally um, but uh, when I did this video uh, this time last week, last week's candle was just like peering over the cliff going, oh my God, we're, we're about to fall out of bed here. And then literally the moment that I ended the video, the market just started cranking back up. <laughs> and I even made reference in that weekly video that, uh, well, you know, I couldn't fault uh, professional traders. Uh, coming in off of um, the bottom end of the range here and uh, playing along. And I have to say, you know, if you actually, you know, like we like to use uh, what's called the 50% rule as sort of a profit objective. I think you could actually have used a mountain man here, but 50% uh, would have been conservative. Um, but there is Mountain Man off of this range, 61.85. There was also a cheeky little gap on this chart. And notice how the market tried to get up into that gap but failed there. But uh, there's good old Mountain Man. So, you know, you could argue this is a Mountain Man to a Mountain Man or even 78.6, but we never did get up to 78.6. I think also, too, if you're looking at this range... Um, you can see the distribution of volume, right? So all those guys coming in, buying against the bottom end of the range last week when we were doing this video. I think actually this was the candle we were doing the video on. And I even said through the video, be careful of fuck yous. And you can see that on this candle right here, they pulled a big honking fuck you. And that's interesting because that was basically getting ready for the Asian session. So they kind of like got all the crypto kids just before the adults come back um, from the weekend break, get all the crypto kids nice and bearish, and then boom, straight up run their stops. Uh, and I think that's probably what this level was here, right? Probably if you did like 10x kind of leverage and all that kind of nonsense, uh, my hunch is that was probably a big liquidity pool up in there. Anyway, point of the matter here is uh, we did get counter trend rallies into reload zones off of this particular range right up in here. And what's really interesting, you know, you level oneers, notice what happened on this move. Notice price went to a higher high. Well, we look down at our momentum indicator and uh oh, hopefully everybody can see. MACD histogram did not make a higher high. Hugely powerful signal. So I remember last week we had sort of talked to you guys, and this is this is what I wanted to talk to the level oneers about, and it's sort of uh, the dovetail um, to uh, this question that was asked. So believe it or not, I actually had a, a plan here with this crazy conversation here today, guys. But um, the question here was, um, you know, can you show us uh, a few more sort of uh, confirmed versus potential MACD divergences? Remember, this is what the level oneers are working on right now. So I actually put this chart together for you guys. And in essence, we have a rule at TRI. And remember, um, you know, how many reasons should you have to justify consider taking a trade? Oh, Nelly! <laughs> There's another one for you, Bob. <laughs> How many reasons should we have to justify the take a trade? Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Ewald. Thank you, RTG. Looks like you guys are getting this shit. So, uh, momentum divergences, uh, how many reasons is that?
A momentum divergence. A momentum divergence. <laughs> How many reasons is that? One, right? <laughs> So is it a good idea just to trade off of a confirmed momentum divergence? Probably not. This is where we get into the, you know, patience and discipline of a trader's life. I mean, to actually get really good at this, fuck, you gotta wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And here I gotta say, in an image here, people, this is a perfect example of this. Where what I like to teach in the program is we want to have half decent trade location. So when we look at it, we go, yeah, that makes sense. That should go up if we're thinking about buying. Or uh, if we're shorting, yeah, that makes sense. Probably should go down. Uh, hello, M. King. Nice to see you, whoever you are. Um, then we'd like to see some sort of, um, you know, how do you say this? Um, signs from the market that, hey, I'm not nearly as strong or I'm not nearly as weak as you really think I am. That's this whole concept of momentum divergence. You can have volume divergence. You can have price divergence. You can have, uh, excuse me, you can have volume momentum divergence. You can have price momentum divergence you can even have volatility momentum divergences which i haven't even included in this education program so uh, that's probably a big thing if i was going to uh, probably add uh, modules to the course uh volatility <coughs> analysis is probably a big uh, a big part of uh educating uh, the the uh, the students on i would uh so, I mean, the irony of it all is I've already got a level four ready to go. It's just, oh my God, you, I got to do more. <laughs> no, <laughs> I want to stop the train. And you know what's so funny is I got one of my uh, OGers and this guy I really like. Um, um, he lives out in Hawaii and a couple, of, I guess a year or two ago, we made a pact that we were going to continue working together until we could go buy a piece of property and open up an orphanage uh, for underprivileged people in Hawaii. That That's my goal, and it's been that since day one with him. Um, and I'm just so over the top pleased that I found a trading setup that really seems to resonate well with him, and we're in a really, really gr good groove right now. And, um, you know, there's sometimes I wake up and go, you know what, we've got a fucking kick-ass plan here. Do I really need to go out and help any more people in the world? I've already, I think I've already made up my, my, uh, my request from JoJo to help the crypto kids through that last cycle. I mean, really, this is after the fact. My job's already done here. But anyway, now I'm blobbing away. But uh, some mornings I wake up and I tell you, man, it sure is easy just to head off and trade horizontal support and resistance in the uh, futures in the Forex market. It's an easy life. But anyway, um... So back to our conversation here. We uh, ideally want to have three reasons. We ideally want location. We ideally would like to see momentum divergence. And here's the most important thing, right? Uh, <laughs> now I like your thinking, Josh. <laughs> uh, and I suppose that might actually work well with your ex, right? I suppose if... Uh, if <laughs> arr, arr, arr. 420 reasons. <laughs> oh, Josh, you're coming out with the numbers. Remember uh, the neighbor of the beast? We haven't even talked neighbor of the beast late, lately with the public, eh? Man, some sick-ass levels there. Anyway, I'm just sort of having fun blabbing away here today. I hope you guys are enjoying this frivolity. And again, my primary purpose is to try and make a positive difference in your guys' life. So, uh, by all means, I sure hope somebody uh, can write something down out of all of this and uh, go, you know what? Actually, that was worth wasting a couple hours of my day. Anyway, um, and, you know, for people watching this later on, you can actually hear me relatively well if you put me on, like, 1.5 speed or 2 times speed. Uh, believe it or not, I'm actually still uh, understandable, so that's a way to sort of sh save some time. Okay, back to our story. This is like Millhouse. When are we going to get to the fireworks factory? 
<laughs> um, okay. All right. H-X-R-O. Uh, if that is your real name. Colin. <laughs> and maybe that isn't even you. Maybe that's somebody else. <laughs> okay. Um, divergence. <laughs> Jeez, we'll get on to this. Uh, yeah, well, I used to have a guy on trading view. Oh, Ewald says, uh, sometimes I fall asleep listening to uh, Brian. Um, uh, it's all good. Hey, hey, call him. You can be in whatever account you want to be. Everyone on YouTube and Twitter is bullish. Moon boys, more reason to be bears. Well, actually, you know, Omar, remember that violently flat kind of thinking? You know, really what I think our future is going to look like is this. And it's going to drive everybody crazy. Is I think our new near future is going to look like uh, this. <laughs> So, you know, like here we are now, and you can see the back and forth. They're going to fuck around with the, the, the kids. 9,800 is the upside here just in the short term. And I think this trend line here seems to be uh, wanting to be respected here. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised the end of July, maybe beginning of August, there's one more big moon boy pump. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me. And then on the other side of it, they get everybody long, and then they just break their fucking hearts. Um, and, and ironically enough, everybody at this point is going to be like, okay, this is the dump. Now we go. And then they just turn it around, bring it right back up. Um, and interestingly enough, I thought, I, I thought this was really interesting. Uh, this is this crazy, uh, June, uh, July 1st, uh, uh, pivot that I'm kind of thinking, uh, was sort of this celestial pivot here. Here was that April panic dump, uh, and it's fascinating how if I just replicate that price action and then just duplicate it on the other side, I get this very interesting image and it looks very much like my billiard ball kind of thinking. So with that said, this is going to be sort of like my roadmap going forward and prove me wrong. You know, if you really are a bull, go and bust out through the top. If you want to dump here, we'll just go bust out through the bottom. But until that happens, this is violently flat kind of shit. Um, and then usually what ends up happening <coughs> is uh, <coughs> most of the Wall Street pros are on vacation right now. Yeah, they're in the Hamptons and all that kind of stuff. Everybody comes back to work the beginning of September after the Labor, Labor Day weekend. And that's, in my opinion, probably when the stock market breaks and things like crypto, uh, BTC as a risk on proxy, bigger market than when it breaks in earnest. And then we start looking for all that crap that I was showing you earlier. You know, all, uh, all of this kind of talk, right, down in here. But my hunch is we're not done with this range just yet. Violently flat. Think of uh, Josh's uh, ex-girlfriend, right? Um, okay, so back to our story. What does violently flat look like from a momentum perspective? You can clearly see we made lower lows in price here. And the MACD has scrammed. And this is just set to the out-of-the-box settings. You might see in the videos, sometimes if I want a little crisper signal, I'll uh, shorten up the fast <clears throat> moving average to nine and I'll slow down the slow average to uh, 30 and this will give me just a little bit crisper did you see how the data crisp crisped up there a little bit this should be perfect for Krispy Kreme <laughs> but I don't know whether you can tell I mean it's not a huge difference actually every single one of these right um, I guess there uh, that is sort of out of the box, default 1226. And I just, you know, especially if I'm trading off a of lower time frames, I just found that actually I like the signals. They're just a little bit crisper. Can you see? Remember a uh, grade three uh, a grammar teacher? We'd like those W's to look nice and crisp. And we'd like those M's to look nice and crisp. So, um, uh, that's why you'll see in the video that I like to use the 9 and 30. If you just want to use the out-of-the-box 1226, totally fine. Um, and actually, you know what? For the purposes of 
this conversation since I drew up all the levels originally off that. Why don't we just stick with that? Okay, so market comes down. Now, at this point, and somebody was asking about this, well, maybe, you know, maybe we could have a trade develop here. And, you know, the default trade for you guys, I think, especially level oneers, is just use the 50% level as your target. And that way you're not too greedy. Because keep in mind, in this case, you can see if I was like, oh, I want to get prof. Eh, fuck it, man. I want 78.6 on this trade or I'm not, I'm not taking anything. Well, you, you're SOL. Right, it did get up to mountain, but you never know. I mean, and you know, Brandon, he'll he'll knock this thing back down in a heartbeat if he can. So I suggest to people conservative, simple, honest, technical level to use to take profits, fifty percent rule. So in this particular case, maybe you're thinking, okay, well, you know, if I can get a momentum divergence to come in, and then maybe I can get price to give me a nice little W. Okay, well, maybe I have a trade. I'm going to risk against the bottom, and I'm going to look to take profits at the 50% rule. Is my long trade profit bigger than my risk? Sure, or, you know, stopped out against these lows. Yes, okay, awesome. But you can clearly see that price did not do that, did it? Yes, it put in the bullish divergence. Ooh, that's awesome. But what I see is that basically the market just sort of stair-stepped its way up to the technical objective, which is very normal. So in this particular case, we had a bullish divergence, but no W came in. So you just got to leave it. Yeah, shit happens. Market hits 50% rule. You look at price now and you go, oh, gee whiz, this doesn't look good. The MACD histogram is making a lower high, even though price made a higher high. What's that? Well, that's potentially a bearish divergence. And sure enough, price melts back a little bit, and then, uh-oh, hey, this is now an M. So at this point right here, right, you gotta be kind of going, ooh, we just hit the 50% rule. Oh, we're not, we're not making higher highs. Is this a confirmed bearish divergence when we are right here, Let's see if anybody knows. At this point right here, is this a confirmed bearish divergence? That's like sort of right there. No, good, excellent. You guys are all getting it in the lounge. I have no idea if the YouTubers get that. No, it isn't. It's a potential divergence and somebody asked, what's the difference between potential and confirmed? In this particular case, it took this price action, this dump to, up. Oh, I am now a confirmed bearish divergence. But our simple rule at TRI is, well, if you see a confirmed, just like this, this was a, bit, a bullish one. If you see a bullish divergence, is it a good idea to be short? Probably not. Well, same thing now. If you see a confirmed bearish divergence, is it really a good idea to be a buyer? Maybe not. So the market comes down, and you know maybe you're thinking short, but I don't see any M's here, and now price is all the way back down against these lows. Is that a good place to actually think about shorting? Probably not. How does our cadence go? Show me a bearish divergence, and then what do I have to see? Anyone? It could be uh, inside bar considered a reversal signal if no W, but when does that inside bar have to fire? Mala, Mayalagan? Mayalagan? Mayalagan. 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 I'm not even going to try and pronounce your last name. All right, maybe you don't know the answer to this. And if you don't, maybe consider joining our education program. Point of the matter here is market confirmed bearish divergence. Now I got to hunt an M. And so what ends up happening here? Oh, well, geez. Uh, what, what? Oh, we made a new low. Oh, but, oh what's momentum? Uh, is this a bullish divergence? Uh, so that means if I see a bullish divergence, what do I have to do if I'm a bear? I got to cool my jets. All right, well, market goes up. Hey, we're back to the 50% low. Hey, we're moving back up to that reload zone that uh, that Beamish guy's all excited about. Maybe this is a short after all. Hey, there's that reload zone. 
Ah, oh, we hit Mountain Man. And remember those day traders, those guys that were just like, I buy against the bottom end of the range, I sell against the top end of the range. They're starting to ring the register on uh, Mountain Man level hits, maybe two to ones, whatever. But And remember, we had this bullish divergence, so bears better cool your jets. Well, that was a good idea. But notice the market made a higher high, and then, uh-oh, what the hell's going on with our momentum indicator? So, as we said there a moment ago, at this point right here, is this a confirmed bearish divergence right here? Good job, uh, lounge people. How about all you crazy YouTubers? More downvotes, please. No confirmed divergence. Where did the confirmation come in? Boom, 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 boom. This candle here. We are now in confirmed bearish divergence. So if you're a trader at this point, what should you be doing? How about hunting for bearish structure? Now the question you have to ask yourself is, well, do we have trade location? Notice what's happening here, which is kind of amusing. Do you see how they could dump the price against these lows, make a new low, but look what our momentum indicator is doing again. They might just paint another divergence here. So what ends up happening is, this is, in essence, a sideways hurry up and do nothing market or something about Josh's girlfriend. Do you see how the two sort of go hand in hand? What does a violently Josh's girlfriend look like? <laughs> what? <laughs> now people are like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> what does a violent Josh's girlfriend look like? <laughs> she looks like this. <laughs> All right, I forgot the X, sorry, Josh. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting, uh, and, and this is what I really like about this, and I'm sort of being silly about this sorry everybody um but this is what i like about using something like a, a macd histogram to tell you about momentum divergences is it helps you understand why this market is a narrow sideways channel and how how what does this violently flat market state looks like well it looks like a whole bunch of really mixed signals and the traders just are not getting trades right the divergence confirms here that's a horrible place what well, we you know and like i said with this one the divergence confirms here as i showed you initially if i wanted to hunt a trade trading this thing back up and it was nice and conservative, what I want to see is give me some goddamn W's after the divergence is confirmed. But we're not getting that. So if anything, you know, this is an excellent analogy, in my opinion, of a narrow sideways channel. And what does a flat market state look like from a momentum perspective? Now, how could we break this in earnest? Well, what happens if we do something crazy like down, oops, uh, down, up, down, breakout? Do you see how what we really want to see if we're a bull is we want to see this market break out through the top here. Every time it gets its butt going, it keeps putting in these damn bearish divergences. Just go and break out through the top. Remember we did all this with, you know, the what does the Bitcoin price look like? It's this crazy chop Vegas. Just go and break out through the top here, and then we'll know we're good to go. But until that happens, I think we are stuck in violently sideways, violently flat. And what I'm really worried about here is if somebody sneezes. I don't know what they're, where the sneeze is going to come from. But, you know, we need to understand that if you are a conservative Joe Sixpack, slow poke investor, 
This is not really the place where you want to take a big bet. This this is actually a pretty risky market. Where the hell is that damn chart? I hate when I put too many charts on here because then I can never find the chart I was showing you. Uh, no, I don't think it was over here. No. Oh, well, actually, yeah, we can always go back here. Um, you know, if anything, this is, in crypto, what you want to see. Does Bitcoin look like this right now? <laughs> Omar, very well said. Uh, there are so many of these. And actually, isn't that interesting? He's got the... Look at it. Colin's gone fucking totally Hollywood here, man. <laughs> Jeez. Are you, I hope you're a shareholder in this place, Colin. You fucking... You're going in hard here. <laughs> oh, you're all crazy. Um, so, you know, I'm seeing tons and tons of these kind of, um, uh, these kind of stories. There's a beautiful head and shoulders. Uh, David O, I sure hope you picked up that, uh, right shoulder break out there. This has got you written all over it. Uh, it's interesting. This is, uh, Walton's. I remember a guy on, uh, on the site a few years ago used to be really jazzed about this thing. Um, be interesting to see whether he still uh, follows that. I don't know whether those people had the patience and discipline to stick around with these names that long. Um, anyway, um, so point of the matter here is, uh, if Joe Sixpack came to me and said, you know, Brian, where's a nice, safe, secure, kind of conservative place to be thinking about buying Bitcoins? You know, I'm, I'm down here. We are in that violently flat market state with divergences spitting up all over the place. And frankly speaking, it's the whole goddamn risk market. Um, it's not like uh, this is untoward just Bitcoin. It's, I think it's the whole damn risk market because what we're, I mean, 2020, folks, this is, this is unprecedented. Um, to actually go back to similar types of worlds, we have to go back to the world prior to the Second World War. The, uh, the Cold War world is over. <clears throat> Sounds to me like the U.S. hegemony, they leveraged the shit out of that Cold War win and financed sort of like a free 20, 30 years um, riding on the inertia of that war win. But they've shot their wad now. And they're in the process of shooting more wads. Um, is this sustainable? You know, I listened to a guy yesterday from, it was like 2000. And, I, I listened to one video from 2016. And the guy was like, this is it. The market's going to break. And actually what's so cool is yeah, there's the date stamp on the video and there's the FTSE 100 index in the background as he's going, it's the end of the world, market's going to go down, sell everything. And you pull up the price chart and he literally was saying that right at a market bottom and the market went straight up following that interview. <laughs> it's almost funny. So, you know, is it is it in your best interest to uh, get into the game of predicting the future? You've heard me say this repeatedly. No, it isn't. And frankly speaking, whatever reality happens, it's going to be far more bizarre than anything we could predict here. I can absolutely guarantee you that. Um, you know, you probably heard the uh, expression quantitative easing. I mean, nobody ever heard that before 2008. And prior to that, the solution was the stock market would crash, uh, mortgage market would be liquidated, and uh, uh, you know massive amounts of bankruptcies, reset, Great Depression, start this game all over again through the next cycle. That's what should have happened. Uh, the central planners decided to dilute the currency instead. So if you look at asset prices in the diluted currency term, that M2 money supply comparison, you see the Great Depression. It's happening as we speak. But because, you know, in the newspaper, uh, just prices are printed, you don't see that Great Depression. That's, that's, it's a uh, fakazi, right? They've fucked with the system. And the question is, does the market actually buy it? 
Um, I've made the argument all along that uh, really the market will buy it until there's a realistic alternative. Do you think we have a realistic alternative yet? As soon as we don't, as soon as the market believes there is a realistic alternative to the U.S. dollar hegemony, U.S. Federal Reserve as the backstop, this game will keep going. Your price of your loaf of bread will go from $5 to $10 to $15 to $20. Our entire society's standard of living is being sacrificed right now. You all need to understand that. We are, our standard of living is being sacrificed through this money printing process. And actually, I listen to a lot of people, uh, sort of economist type people, they are expecting a hyperinflationary world will kick in probably in the next year or two. And that might be the final sort of kick in the nuts um, that sort of starts off that next cycle. Um, so, you know, you seeing, and you know, this is the sad part about it. The housing market prices will continue to go up. The Fakese requires it. It must happen. Do you see your wages going up at the same time? It's a bit of a tragedy, really. Stock prices will go up. Gold and silver will go up because of the money printing process. They are diluting the purchasing power of our currency right in front of our eyes. The price of a loaf of bread will go up. You have no choice. Is there a term that we could use to describe what is going on in Western society right now? I actually think there is. And interestingly enough, I've actually seen this uh, term used in the crypto universe. And I think it will go on until there is some sort of alternative. No, 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 not stagflation. Totally different. Uh, is there any term? Two words. Actually, you got the first letter correct, Peter. Two words. And it is basically the way the bankers are going to get out of our problem. <laughs> well, I won't go that far, Omar. Weimar Germany is, hey, we don't, we've, we've got an alternative. We don't have to invest in, infl in German paper. If we actually get to that kind of environment, oh, fuck, USA's toast. But let's hope it doesn't get bad, that bad. And I don't think it, it can because the Fed still has a really huge balance sheet of U.S.-denominated assets, so I don't think they're going to allow that to happen. Uh, but what I'm looking for, two words, socialized losses. That is basically what is happening in our society right now. Your standard of living is being cut Asset prices will continue to rise. Your wages will not rise. And you're going to look around one day and you're going to go, fuck, man. I remember when I used to be able to buy so much food at the grocery store and we all had full bellies for dinner. Now we have to buy one pork chop and split it between four people because they're charging $40 a pork chop at the store. I mean, that is what socialized losses look like. That's our future, in my opinion. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> um, so with that said is there an alternative and the great part about it guys is this is right down your alley is there a way no that's the irony of it all is it's not austerity that's the worst part about this RTG RTG in the launch says here austerity no that's the worst part about it if anything it would probably be better for our society if we had a big whack of austerity put all these bankers into bankruptcy right Jerome Powell should go look for a new job. Christine Lagarde should go back to her law firm and be a lawyer. What business does she have being a banker? What really should happen is they should rip the Band-Aid off. We should go through a five, six year period of absolute economic collapse. And we start from a position of strength. But I don't know whether they're going to allow that to happen. I think we're going to just continue the Fakese. But, like I said, there is an out for all of you guys. You're lucky. You know, there, we don't really have that many people who watch this uh, stream. 
And of the six, eight billion people on the planet, do really that many of them actually participate in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency store? Not really. So in a weird sort of way, you guys are actually a little bit lucky. Uh, and I've said this recently. It's not really a case of Bitcoin is so valuable. Is that currency is worthless. Bitcoin 100 G's. I don't see any reason. I don't see any reason why not. Your loaf of bread, of course, is going to be $100 at the grocery store, but eh, shit happens. So, you know, prepare. And really, the best way to deal with all of this is just be diversified. You know, own some euros, own some U.S. dollars, own some Canadian dollars, own some stock, own some bonds, own some crypto, own some gold, own some soybeans, own some... Hell, own some sky gold. What do you think this thing's going to do if gold goes to $5,000 an ounce? <laughs> I can just imagine. This This would probably, my hunch is, if I just left this alone, this is fucking Joshua's car right there. <laughs> or Josh's car, not Joshua. That's a different person. <laughs> Actually, Joshua already drives a Tesla. <laughs> so Josh just simply, simply wants to grow up into, Joshua. <laughs> that's good. I didn't realize that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so actually we should do like a before and after. <laughs> Josh, young guy, he's so cute. I swear, you just, mwah. as Jojo used to say, you just want to pop him into your mouth and go, mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> and Joshua is the grown up. <laughs> Anyway, okay, I've been blabbing away here for a couple hours. I hope you guys enjoyed the frivolity. Um, please remember, everybody, that uh, uh, this is edutainment. Um, we are not in the business of telling you what to do with your money. Clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, right? You all should understand and know that. Um, been at this game for about 30 years, probably even longer than that now. One, oh, fuck yeah, it is more than 30. Jesus. Um, I don't know whether, uh, you know, if any of you see a picture of me, you'd probably be surprised. You'd probably look at me and go, there's no way you're uh, even able to have 33 years working experience in the market, Brian. But, you know, it, as I told my hairdresser the other day, I asked her how old she thought I was, and she took 15 years off my age. I was like, oh, that's nice. Um, but there's a reason why um, I still have quite a bit of the hair on the top of my head. There's a reason why I'm not gray. There's a reason why I'm not white. Um, I, um, I don't like to uh, live high anxiety life. I, I don't like that life. Uh, I like to wake up in the morning and not really worry about anything. Just And when I come into the market and I do these videos and stuff for you guys, I'm just having fun. And this is what I do for fun. <laughs> you guys are thinking, this guy's crazy. He's been blabbing away here for two hours, and I don't expect a single penny in remuneration. All I expect is for you guys to learn. Pick up on this. Make a better difference, you know, make it, this is everything that Jojo told me when she came to me, right? It's just, you have the opportunity to make a positive difference in this world, and that is what I'm doing day in, day out. And that's the God's honest truth. So on that note, guys, um, I'm not going to say this life is easy. I'm not, I mean, I've been through absolute horror. I mean, I live every day of my life with a poor little human being who, you know, he'll never even understand half of the stuff that I do. Half. He'll never understand maybe even 10% of what I do. So trust me, life sucks. It's brutal. But at the same time, too, we got to get through this. So, you know, let's all try and work together. Don't try and take advantage of each other. PMA for the win. I really like this community. I have to tell you. This community saved me. And uh, my job for the rest of my life is to try and, uh, and help you. 
but that's what I'm here to do. All right, everybody. Have yourself a great day. Take it easy. All the best. Let's ramp up those downvotes. And bye for now.